I'm carrying on from last week's video on insulin resistance. So if you haven't seen that already, it might be a bit confusing for you. Link will be in the description to the first part. We got to the point where glucose gets prevented from entering cells and so it can then cause damage to parts of the circulation system because it ends up hanging around in the bloodstream. Now, if the cell is completely satisfied in its energy needs and decides can't take any more for safety reasons, then you know it needs to shut out glucose. Couldn't be a more obvious sign that you need to stop eating carbohydrates at this point. Now, if the cell is preventing entry of glucose for safety reasons, even with insulin around, then clearly the last thing we should be doing is forcing glucose into the cell, isn't it? We obviously 100% do not want that to happen. Now, we can't see that as a disease that's happening. We have to see it as a safety mechanism. When a phone stops accepting charge after it's reached 100%, it's not because it's broken or not working properly. It's because if it tried to take in more after 100%, then it'd probably catch on fire. So the last thing we want to do is force more charge into the phone when it's decided it's had enough already. Hopefully, this analogy is simple enough to translate from uh, a phone accepting charge to a cell accepting glucose. As a side note, actually, uh, just because I think people might find it interesting, in case you don't know already, insulin isn't just about sending glucose into cells. Also, there's lots of other jobs, like, um, you know, it's used in storing fat in fat cells, which are called adipocytes. And we can store it because we can convert fat to glucose and then use that for energy later. Fat's a bit like a pantry where we can put food for later, which we don't need right now. So insulin also sets up an environment where fat cells know not to break down their existing fat stores, simply because we've got readily available glucose already in, in this current moment as a result of what we've eaten. So if you're trying to burn fat for one reason or another, this is a really important concept to understand. So you don't waste your time by carb loading and then doing exercise. But back to glucose. When the blood level remains high, the pancreatic beta cells can continue to produce insulin to really plead with the cells to take in this extra glucose. This uh, excessive wear and tear on them, on the, on the beta cells, is not good. And you know, the driving into the cells of glucose when they don't want any more obviously isn't going to be either. So we end up with this situation where glucose levels, if you were to, be, to measure them, they might not look too bad. But just measuring the glucose doesn't show us the unhealthy elevated levels of insulin that it took to achieve that. And when we reach that point, point where uh, a, a doctor is trained to give someone the label of insulin resistant, we end up at a point where fat cells don't get the right messages either of storing fat when there's insulin in the bloodstream. And that's really important for what we call visceral fat, i.e., fat that's on our organs as opposed to under our skin. So the fat cells can release their fat into the bloodstream. And that's like when you're at a restaurant that has one of those conveyor belts with dishes that the chefs make, and those dishes get sent around to all the customers on the conveyor belt. The chef releases the dish because they think someone will want it. Then a customer that does want it takes it out of circulation and anything the body needs to send from one place to another uses this exact analogical mechanism. But when nothing picks that fat up off the conveyor belt, it's like a chef that makes a dish which no one wants to take off. And so the liver comes in and, and it takes it instead because no one else has. It picks it up and it uses it to create a lipoprotein particle. So those of you that have heard of something called ApoB, for example, it's a type of lipoprotein. It stands for Apo or Apolipoprotein B. And LPs are fats or, or lipids, to use a technical term, that are combined with proteins. And that happens because lipids by themselves aren't actually soluble in the aqueous portion of blood, which is plasma. Now, when the lipoprotein package is created, the fat cells can then take that up when they see some. But then the same fat cell can actually just release it again. And if that cycle keeps repeating, then you have chronically elevated levels of triglycerides in the blood, just like if you had lots of fructose in your diet too. So the issue that a lot of people face without realizing is seeing this raised level, uh, which is called tri hypertriglyceridemia, by the way, uh, and not knowing whether it's from dietary fat or from 
dietary fructose. A default response from loads of doctors, even ones that I've actually witnessed do this right in front of me, is to say, well, Mrs. Smith, this is because the amount of insulin that's hanging around. And I just cringe because there are real patients being treated by this level of ignorance. They literally have no idea that fructose can do the same thing. Fructose can cause the liver to make triacylglycerides. And you know what? If, God forbid, if one of you get a, given a diagnosis of hypertriglyceridemia, then in that very moment, ask your doctor whether it's from insulin problems or from fructose. And how do you know it's one and not the other for my individual case? If they don't even know that fructose can do the same thing, please walk away and see another doctor. The solution to all this is still the same. Reduction of dietary carbohydrates as much as possible, in my personal case, to zero. In nature, we always find glucose and fructose together. So if you eat a lot of fruits, then from the education I've gone through here so far, you're probably more able to get hypertriglyceridemia than I am as someone that eats no dietary carbs and so has no insulin spikes. But don't get me wrong, I can still get it as a carnivore. In fact, all carnivores can still get it. If you eat carnivore with too much protein and not enough fat, then you can still get elevated levels of blood glucose because excess protein in the diet will be converted to glucose, and that can then give you raised blood glucose levels too. That's why it's not a bad idea to change diet slowly and, and, and under supervision as well. In fact, if any of you want that, uh, you know, want a consultation to do that, my website is in the description below. But here's some tips from doing this for my own patients. Don't think that one type of carbohydrate is better in any way than another. They're all glucose, as far as the cell is concerned. And the only thing you need in your head is what would my cell be thinking now if it had a brain? Well, it has no idea what you're eating. It just sees glucose coming in. So if the cells see all carbohydrates as the same thing, glucose, then that's a perspective you need to remember when making your dietary choices. Because whether you eat a sugar cube or a slice of bread or sweet potato or pasta, it's the exact same thing causing the problem, which is glucose trying to enter the cell when the cell has had too much to cope with already. So even the ideas of you know, fast or slow carbs, clean or dirty carbs, or natural or unnatural carbs, if the cell could talk, it would say that it's all kind of nonsense because I still get attacked by too much of the same thing, which is glucose. Second, changing diet means your gut microbiome will change. If you do this too suddenly, then there's gonna be gut problems for you. This is why I get my patients to change their diet over kind of eight to 12 weeks on average. So don't expect to switch things up overnight and then miraculously feel incredible in just one month. Never gonna happen. Um, I also wanna to touch briefly on fiber. It's because I know some people say that fiber can slow down the rate of glucose going into the bloodstream. Uh, now I don't doubt that, I'm sure that's true. Um, but I'm going to relate fiber to something which a lot of people also say, which is that a high meat intake gives you colon cancer because undigested meat rots the colon. Now, I have my thoughts on fiber, but for the purpose of this video, I'm not going to give you them. I want you instead to think for yourselves with what I'm about to tell you. If meat is supposed to rot the colon, on its way to giving you cancer there because it just sits there undigested, then what you'd expect to see in someone that's lost their colon and has an artificial bag there instead is lots of undigested meat collecting into the bag. I found out about someone recently who has this exact change in their body. They lost their colon. I'm not gonna tell you what in the diet caused it because you can work it out for yourselves here. And now they have a bag there. His YouTube channel is called Kent Carnivore, which I'll link below. He has this incredible ability to know with 100% certainty what actually hits our colons because he can actually look inside his colon every day, the bag that is now replacing it. What do you think collects in the bag there and therefore destroyed his original colon? Do you think it's meat because we apparently can't digest it? Or do you think it could be something else like fiber slash plant food. 
And what do you think nurses who see these bags every single day would tell you is in those bags?